Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and also for inviting me. Uh, so yes, uh, we'll be talking about uh, things that are very much related, um, uh, which is uh, distributed semi maximization. And the motivation comes from uh, big data sets. So you can think of a uh, setting where we have too much data. And this is based on joint work with Rafael Barbosa. He's my student. Hui Nguyen, he's at TTI, and Justin, who's here, I, think, I believe, and he's now at EPFL. Good. All right, so, so, so here is sort of, uh, so, so the perspective that we're interested in here is uh, the, the, perhaps a standard combinatorial optimization viewpoint, uh, where uh, the basic premise is that we have some finite ground set of elements that we want to optimize over, and uh, we have some function that tells us how good these uh, various subsets of these elements are. And uh, well, we also have some constraints. So, so not all of these subsets are feasible for our problem. And our goal is to find one of these feasible subsets that maximizes our objective function. So, so I'll be thinking about maximization in the setting. And of course, as stated, this is a very general problem because you know, these functions can be arbitrary and uh, uh, the feasible sets can be arbitrary and so on. So, so there's an inherent tension here between the generality of this framework and how general uh, this function is and the constraints uh, which will allow us to capture many different problems, and also at the same time the need for very efficient algorithms. So we would want to solve these problems. Okay. Uh, so, so if we uh, keep f very general, the function very general, and the constraints very general, uh, then in general there's not much we can do. So, so we'll need to impose some sort of a constraint uh, on these. So, so what would be a natural one? Well, so I presume that you've all been here for the entire week, unlike me. Uh, so, so you probably already know that a very natural constraint that is very general is that of some modularity. And uh, I think it's highly unlikely that you haven't seen the definition of a some module function. But if you haven't, uh, it's a, these are set functions uh, defined on a finite solid ground set uh, that satisfy this inequality for any two subsets. Uh, so throughout this talk, uh, my objective function f uh, that I'm trying to maximize will be some modular. And in fact, I'll also assume that it's monotone, and this is not crucial, and I'll mention a few things about non-monotone functions at the end. And of course, they uh, capture diminishing returns, and this is what one of the uh, things that makes them very, uh, very useful in a variety of settings. And uh, one of the reasons why smarter functions are so, so popular is because they really do capture many studies of interest. So, so this is indeed a quite a general setting, and the reason is because many functions that uh, might arise in practice uh, happen to be so modular. Uh, so, so one example is uh, the coverage function. So if we have a collection of sets <laughs> and uh, uh, we uh, define the value of a subset to be just the number of different elements they cover, uh, also the entropy of a set of random variables and also uh, things like cuts uh, and, and graphs, either direct or undirected and hypergraphs, and the rank function of a matroid, and so on. Uh, so, so they're very general, much more general than linear functions. And this is one of the reasons why uh, imposing some modularity as the only restriction gives us a very rich framework. OK? Uh, so just to make this concrete, let me give you two examples of some modular maximization with constraint. And you can think about it is throughout the talk. And if I have time, I'll mention some experiments involving them. Uh, so, so the first example is what we call a sensor coverage problem, but with multiple modes. Okay, so, so, so the setup is that we have some sensors and we want to place them in a network. And uh, we need to uh, find locations for these sensors. And there's some set of locations that we can use. And um, each of these sensors will actually uh, be able to operate in different modes. So you can set the mode of a sensor and depending on mode you use, you'll get a different coverage profile. And our goal is to find both the sensor locations and also the modes for these sensors so that we cover as much area as possible. Okay? So for example, here's one sensor. And in this uh, two example, all of the modes, uh, uh, the coverage profiles are ellipses. So each of these ellipses corresponds to a different coverage profile. Uh, so maybe I place it here, and I place another sensor, and so on. So, so these are the locations of the three sensors, but I also need to pick one mode, so maybe something like this. And this is the total area that I cover, everything in these ellipses. 
OK, uh, so, so if you think about it for a moment, you might realize that this is actually fits in the framework that I just mentioned. It's a semi-modular maximization with a constraint. Uh, so why is, why is this a modular? Well, because uh, the, the coverage of these ellipses is a modular. And what kind of constraints are we interested in? Well, it's sort of, it's sort of like a partition matrix constraint, because for each sensor, we can only uh, use one of the modes. So, so it's a partition matrix constraint. Uh, so the second example that I that I, that I want to use uh, is that of identifying elements uh, that are representative in a very large data set. And specifically, I'll consider one specific data set, which is called tiny images. And the reason is because it consists of many, many, many little images. So each of these things is a little image. Okay. And we want to find uh, some very small subset of these images that are representative. They summarize this data set somehow. Okay, so maybe these ones. Okay, good. Uh, so, so, so this is sort of a, it's a perhaps a yield post problem, uh, but uh, there's a specific way to model it, which actually comes from machine learning. So, so machine learning people, one of the models that they have for this problem is actually what a theoreticians might consider to be a clustering setting. So, so let me walk you through that, just so that we have an example. Uh, so, so, so this basic setup is that we have our set of images, and you can think of it as being huge. And, um, and we'll store each of these images as some multi-dimensional uh, multi vector. And the, thing, the second thing that we'll have is that uh, we, can, uh, we've, we have a way of comparing images. So, so given two images, we can say how related they are. And I'll assume that this is encoding using some function uh, that tells me how different they are. You can think of it as a distance function, but it's not necessarily satisfying the triangle inequality. And uh, given all of that, what we want is to pick a very small subset of the images, let's say k of them, uh, that will minimize some, some loss. Okay, so, so, so what is this loss? So if S is the set of images that I pick, this loss is really, uh, you can think of it as the um, a k median objective. So, so for, each, for each image, I'll pay the minimum distance between that image and its closest um, image in the, in the set that I picked. Uh, so, so this is just the k, the k median cost of that set. And I'll actually normalize it by the total number of images so that I get a loss between 0 and 1. OK? So, so, so this, uh, this loss function is not submodular. It's, in fact, supermodular. So, so if one sort of wants to think about submodular optimization, one could flip this some, some on. So, so one way to do this is just uh, to pick one of the uh, vectors, let's say the origin. And instead of looking at this loss function, we looked at this shifted a submodular function, which is just this constant, which is the loss of the origin, minus the loss that we would get by adding s uh, to the origin. Okay. Okay. So, so this is a constant. This is a supermodular function. So, so this is a submodular function. So, so, so we could instead think about maximizing this submodular function, subject to a cardinality constraint. Right, exactly. Uh, but uh, this distance is not necessarily, as it does not, it's not really a metric. Um, yeah. uh, no, because uh, everybody has to travel to the origin. So here, they only pay less. So, so I have many more options with where to go. So I'm only closer to S to mean E0. OK, so, so this is non-negative and submodular. Um, so, so this is another example of uh, mono, uh, monotone submodular maximization, in this case with a cardinality constraint. Okay, good. All right. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, one inherent difference between uh, the setting that we'll be looking at and perhaps other settings that we've seen is that in this case, we are really are dealing with very large data. So this data set that I mentioned, this tiny images, has about 80 million images. And that might not be so bad, but if you think about it, for each pair of these, I also have distances. So that's really like 80 million squared. And that's way too much information for me to be able to store, or at least on my machine. 
so, so what would happen in the setting is that actually sort of our data is actually spread out across several machines. And even if it's not, it's still beneficial for us to spread it out and sort of uh, use a parallel framework such as MapReduce to, to find a solution. So really what we're asking here is, well, what should we do if uh, this happens? Okay. Uh, so so this, this will be the setup. So we'll be interested in a, a parallel or distributed algorithms for these problems. And just, just to remind you, the problem that I'm trying to solve is I, I have a Samaj function that I, that I want to maximize subject to some constraint. And uh, for, for the purpose of this talk, I'll just assume it's a uh, downward close uh, constraint. So you can think of a cardinality constraint or a matroid constraint and so on. Um, and uh, just to set up some notation, I'll use n to denote the size of the entire ground set. So this is the big data set. And k will be uh, the maximum size of any feasible solution. So in the cardinality case, it's just the cardinality. And the matroid case is the rank and so on. And m will be the number of machines. So this is how many machines I have. This is uh, what I can use to split my data. OK, good. All right, so, so, so before getting to parallel algorithms, uh, let me just briefly remind you about how, how do we actually solve submodular maximization in the sequential setting. And there, actually, there's a very nice algorithm, which I'm sure you all know, uh, which is the greedy algorithm, uh, which uh, starts with an empty set, and it just builds the solution one by one. And the way it does it is just greedily. So, uh, so in every step, you'll pick an element uh, that gives us the best marginal gain. OK? So this is very nice and very simple. And in the sequential setting, uh, this is actually quite nice uh, because it comes with uh, perhaps surprising approximation guarantees. Uh, so, so for cardinality, we get 1 minus 1 over e. And even for a matrix, we get a half approximation. Uh, so, so the only downside of the greedy algorithm is that it's inherently sequential. So at every step, I need to know all of the data in order for me to compute all of the marginal values. Otherwise, I don't know which one is the best one. And also, it also it's uh, somewhat slow. Its running time is about n times k. Uh, so it's uh, inherently not what we want to do for a uh, distributed setting. OK? OK, so, so, so what can we do in a distributed setting? Uh, so, so this is a question that was asked in previous work, and in particular by this really nice work of Mizar Soleiman et al. Uh, so the machine learning people, this was the NIPS 2013 paper. And this is precisely the question that they're asked. In the distributed setting, how do we maximize the module function? And uh, their solution was remarkably simple. So let me tell you what that was. So they suggested the following very simple distributed greedy algorithm. So, so let's take our data set, maybe at the collection of tiny images, and we'll partition it on the machines. And on each of the machines, we'll just run the sequential greedy algorithm. So on each of the machines, I'll run greedy. And I'll pick k elements on each of those machines. And then I'll take all of these elements together, put them on a single machine. And I run the greedy algorithm again uh, to get my final k uh, elements. OK? Uh, so, so this was their algorithm. And this is very nice. This is exactly what a practitioner might want to do in a setting like this. And it's, it's great because it's embarrassingly parallel. It only requires two rounds of communication, and each machine only sends k elements, which is typically small. Uh, so, so this is quite nice. Um, and so, so this was great. Uh, they were also asked the question, OK, uh, we can do this, but what kind of approximation guarantees can we get? And the answer that they gave was, perhaps what you would expect. So they, they said, OK, so the, uh, the approximation ratio scales uh, with m or k, whichever is smaller. Um, so, so this kind of approximation guarantee is not great, because we wouldn't want that. So, so the number of machines is potentially large. Uh, so, so this is not quite satisfactory. Okay, And uh, in fact, uh, they, want, they went one step further, and they showed that, in fact, there are settings where even if you actually were able to use the optimal algorithm on this, each of the machines, you still couldn't escape from, from this kind of a, uh, guarantee. Okay. So, so it seems that inherently in this distributed setting, if you're aiming for something so simple, 
this is really what we should expect, and this is really what we should get. And it turns out that actually this is not quite true. Even if just using greedy, it helps a bit. So, so, so one could actually uh, improve this slightly. Uh, so instead of the uh, 1 over m, you get something like 1 over square root of m. And this is because the problem just doesn't have optimal uh, substructure. So actually doing something suboptimal helps here. But still, there's still uh, a very big uh, dependency on m. Good. All right. And uh, this is not an artifact of the analysis. Uh, so, so if the, the data is partitioned arbitrarily, we can actually construct bad examples that will elicit this kind of behavior. Um, and in fact, in this setting, when the data is partitioned arbitrarily, we should expect uh, this kind of behavior. And we have some very nice lower bounds, uh, in particular the ones from the work of Indic et al. And also Morteza has some really nice lower bounds. Uh, that suggests that really we should lose uh, proportional to, to k or m. But nevertheless, uh, uh, this algorithm has been used in practice, and uh, they did extensive experiments on real instances, and it actually worked very well. And it does quite well. Uh, it comes very close to the, uh, the sequential greedy uh, performance. Uh, so it's a very intriguing question as to why. Why, why is this working so well? Is, is this something in the data, or is this something else? And if one looks a little bit more closely, uh, it's tempting to conjecture that, in fact, there's something else going on. It's not just the data. There's also randomness that comes into the picture. And why is that? Well, because the way they did this experiment, they randomly distributed the data. So, so in fact, if one looks at their experiments, this is, they actually use a randomized distributed greedy which is exactly as before, only that in the first step, uh, they randomly split the data. So, so each element goes to uh, one of the machines chosen uniformly at random. OK? OK, so, so, so this was the variant that we analyzed. So, so we asked, OK, can we actually show much better approximation guarantees for this randomized distributed greedy? And uh, the answer turns out to be yes. Uh, so, 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 so both we and Morteza and Wahab uh, showed that um, uh, this randomized distributed greedy gets very nice constant factor approximations. Uh, so I believe more I will tell you a little bit about their results. So what I'll tell you about in this talk is the following result, which says that if the greedy algorithm achieves a certain approximation, let's call it C, then this randomized distributed greedy comes very close. In fact, it's only worse by a factor of two in expectation. Okay. So, so for, uh, for, for, um, for constraints for which greedy achieves a constant factor approximation, this is really uh, honest uh, constant factor approximation in the distributed setting. OK? It can be anything. It doesn't, uh, there's no dependency on the number of machines. Uh, so, so the number of machines can be anything. The approximation is only one half times uh, C. Uh, so, so, so this, uh, this, uh, this is a great question. This is a key point. There's really no dependence on k or m or anything like that. OK? Good. All right. So, so in the next 10 minutes, I'll tell you how we did this. OK. OK, so, so first of all, what is the high-level intuition? Why do things change so dramatically when we randomly partition the data as opposed to having some arbitrary partition? Um, and to get some intuition, let's, let's try to think about the following two extremes. Okay, so, so the first, so, so the first extreme, uh, which is perhaps you know intuitively simpler, is uh, let's let's think about uh, the following setting. So, so let's let's fix uh, an optimal solution. I'll just call that out. And I'm interested in understanding what happens to these elements in this optimal solution in this uh, randomized algorithm. Okay. So, so if we we're extremely lucky, one thing could happen is that uh, the elements of this optimal solution are selected in the first round with very good probability. Okay? And why is this good? Well, because they'll end up on the last machine with very good probability. So the solution that we get on the final round will be very good. Okay? So, so, so that's, that's the easy case, of course. But of course, one could ask uh, what happens in the other extremes. So what if 
we know that the elements of this optimal solution are actually selected with very low probability. So they're not, almost never selected. Uh, then intuitively, what we can say is that really, I mean, the reason why they were not selected is because they're better things that the greedy algorithm selected. So, so opt uh, is not very different from a typical solution uh, that we found in uh, the first round. So, so then we would expect that even if we just look at uh, the greedy solution on just one of the machines in the first round, then that would be good enough. And this is exactly the right intuition. Um, so I'll try to formalize this a little bit. Um, so, so, but, yeah. So uh, Because I'm talking here about expectations, really. You, you'll see in a moment what I mean. Uh, so, so typical solution means like uh, a solution on a random sample that I constructed in the first uh, in the first round. So um, is this only works because each each machine in the first round sees a, a random sample that is indistinguishable from from the others. Okay, good. All right. So, so before I actually formalize this intuition, uh, let me tell you about two things that uh, that are needed. Uh, to make this a little bit more precise. And one of them is actually, it's, it's, it's a key, uh, key idea. It's actually a key observation. Um, so, so the observation is that the greedy algorithm, and not just the greedy algorithm, but it, the greedy algorithm has a very nice property, which we'll call the greedy property, um, which uh, basically sort of uh, tells us something very interesting about the algorithm. So, so what is this? So, so, so the idea is, is the following. So consider, uh, so, so Im imagine that we have a set S and two elements X and Y. And consider running the greedy algorithm with S and together with X and see what happens. And let, let me suppose that X is actually not picked by the greedy algorithm. So the greedy algorithm prefers elements in S over X. Okay? And, um, also, let's suppose that the same thing happened with Y. So if I just have S and Y, again, the greedy algorithm does not select Y. It prefers things in S. Then what I need is that if I have S to get with both X and Y, the greedy algorithm still prefers things in S and will never accept neither X nor Y. Okay, so, so this is clearly true for the greedy algorithm because it's sort of, it's using the marginal values and this will not change. Okay. Uh, so, so this is a creep property that we'll use, and it's really the, the only property that we need from the greedy algorithm. And uh, the second thing that I'll need, and this is just a technical uh, uh, thing, is uh, the, the notion of a Lovast extension of a Samaja function. Uh, so, so, so we don't need the definition of this in this talk. All, we, all I need it for is to be able to talk about the value of fractional vectors. Okay, so, so all we need to know about it is that it's convex. And it agrees with our function on integral points, on actual sets. Okay? Good. All right, so, so now that we have all of that, let me try to sketch the analysis. Uh, so, so, so the crucial idea for the analysis is to sort of define um, certain quantities of interest, in which in this case will be uh, certain probabilities Okay, so as I mentioned, really, um, the key to this analysis is to understand what is the probability for a given element of opt, what is the probability that will be selected in the first round, okay? So, so let, me, let me give this uh, a name. So I'll define PE to be the probability over a random sample of the ground set uh, that is selected by the greedy algorithm when uh, it has this random sample together with E. Okay, so why random sample? Well, this uh, random sample is really exactly what each machine sees. It sees a random sample. Okay, uh, so, so, so these probabilities really are the key to the analysis. Um, and the reason for this is that they tell us what the distribution is of the portion of up that ends up on the last machine. So, so is, and uh, by the convexity of the Lovash extension, this automatically tells us that the final solution that we pick on the last machine will have value that is at least f of p, 
f hat of p, where uh, the f hat is just the Lovash extension. So in expectation, I'll get, uh, get at least this much from the last machine um, if I were to compute uh, the optimal solution there. Um, the tricky part is actually understanding what happens to the elements that are not picked on, the, on, on any of the machines. And there, this is where we use the greedy property. Because if you think about it, so if we think about all of these elements that were rejected on their machines, uh, so, so if I add them one by one, they'll be rejected. So even if I had all of them together on, um, on a machine, together with a random sample, they will still be rejected by the greedy property. So, so whatever the, um, the greedy algorithm picks is at least as good as uh, just the value of those rejected elements together. Okay? Uh, so, so, so that is the key inside. Um, and, uh, and that's exactly basically the analysis. With a little bit more work, that's essentially the analysis. Uh, so on the final uh, machine, the greedy solution will be in expectation at least as good as what we would expect, um, which is f hat of p. And uh, otherwise, what we can get on just a single machine in the first round in expectation is also an alpha approximation of the rejected elements, which in expectation have value this much. So if we put these two together by convexity, we get that the better of these two is at least alpha over two approximation. OK? Um, so, so this is uh, the analysis at a very high level, of course, but it is really, this, this is really almost all of it. Okay, and uh, just let me mention, okay, so uh, we've uh, talked about uh, monotonous and some other function. So, so this is one of the things that we need. Um, in addition to this, uh, the only th other thing that we need is that the constraint is hereditary. And we also need this greedy property, which is actually quite important. But otherwise, uh, th this approach is fairly general. Um, yeah, so, so whenever we get an alpha approximation in the sequential setting, then that automatically translates to a, a com comparable approximation in the disputed setting. Okay, um, uh, so I've been talking about monotone functions so far, uh, and that's because, you know, running the greedy algorithm requires us to work with monotone functions. Uh, but in fact, we can extend all of this to non-monotone functions. Uh, and the idea is very simple. Uh, so, so one way to do it is in the first round, uh, so we have all of the data partitioned, we'll still run the greedy algorithm, although the function is non-monotone. So we'll run it anyway and collect all of those solutions. But in the second round, we'll actually do something else. So, so the function is non-monotone, so, but we can just use whatever non-monotone algorithm we, we choose. And, uh, uh, it, and this all will turns out we, we still get constant factor approximations for, for many problems. OK. Um, right, so I think I'm run, uh, out of time. So I'll skip. I had a couple of experiments, so I'll skip those. So let me conclude with some questions. Um, so, so, so what are uh, some other th uh, things that we could do here? So, so one, uh, one, one that I like quite a bit is whether we can actually relax this greedy property. So, so this turned out to be, yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, slightly worse. Uh, it's slightly worse than one half. I can tell you more offline. But uh, not, not much worse. OK, good. OK, so, so one question that I find very interesting is, can we actually relax this greedy property even further? So for this analysis, it seems to be crucial. Uh, is there, but can we relax it in any way? Uh, because of this, it would be nice uh, sometimes to sort of use algorithms that are not exactly greedy or greedy-like. Uh, also, another question that I like is, uh, on the final machine, we aggregate all of these solutions. So, so this is potentially a sizable set because we get k elements from each machine. So it would be nice to sort of reduce that down further. And of course, we can always ask, can we get better approximation guarantees? There's no indication that we need to lose a factor of two. Um, and I'll briefly mention some, some follow-up work. So, so it turns out that if we are willing to do more rounds, then we can get much better approximations. So we have some follow-up work on the archive that gets uh, nearly optimal uh, guarantees with more rounds. OK, 
Okay, so this is all I wanted to say. Thanks. that is proportional to so some, some combination of the EV approximation and the approximation of the sum of all things that you use on the last mission. So you're not they're not the same, then you will get some expression depending on those two. So so basically the, the setting where you might want to do this is, is where you M is huge and K is very small and M is also very small. So n times K uh, is much, much smaller than M. But yeah, so that, that's the reason why it would be good not to have such a setting. So have less things, ideally 